Good afternoon, my beautiful babes and babettes. How are we? You're all looking very attractive. Love it, love it. Working it. I got my dates mixed up. My mom actually had Friday off, not Monday. So I skipped Friday and I'm now doing the video on Monday. Hence the reason why we are here. Today, I would like to talk about the calls to action numbers 16 through 20 in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. These ones did not make me froth at the mouth with anger for the most part. One of them was actually quite inspiring. Um, more than one actually, but one of them really piqued my attention. So we're going to talk about that now. And it's going to be lovely for all of us because I finally found the enlargement button for this file so I don't have to lean in as far. Woohoo. Uh, it's fun to be visually impaired. Okay. We call upon, number 16, sorry. We call upon post-secondary institutions to create university and college degree and diploma programs in Aboriginal languages. Yes! Thank you! Good gods in the heaven, this is what I've been saying from the beginning. Personally, I would take that one step further and start it in elementary school, which is when you start French. French and English are not endemic to this continent, even if the majority cultures speak French and English in Canada. The languages that are endemic to this continent are not taught in our mainstream schools. They're not. And I personally feel that they should be because language forms identity to pretty much as great an extent as any other thing you have in your arsenal. More even than your race, more even than your sex and gender to some degree. Like this is how we as a social species relate to one another. The whole thing about language is that it is so structurally important to a culture, to a people, to the world that George Orwell himself basically wrote 1984 in defense of keeping language, you know, making it a vital and important force in our lives. And I honestly think that Aboriginal languages should be taught from elementary school onward. And it, in my, you know, in my ideal fantasy land, would be the regional languages in which the mainstream school is set. So in my case, it would be the Atawandran language, it would be Anishinaabe, it would be what they speak at Oneida Nation, it would be, you know, Muncie, Delaware. All of these cultures, there are over 500 indigenous cultures in Canada alone. All of these cultures have distinct languages or fairly distinct languages, okay? They could be coupled together fairly easily depending on the region we're talking about here. But you have to remember as well that indigenous people did not recognize the same national boundaries that we recognize. So for example, the Wollastook Nation on the East Coast, that goes all the way from New Brunswick down into Maine. Nowadays, that would be separated into two countries according to our version of geography, but not before we got here, not before we started mucking around with a map. So honestly, I do think that if the majority culture is going to take it upon themselves to help the indigenous resurgence, which I strongly recommend we do, um, we need to start doing this. We need to take it upon ourselves to bring in specialists from these nations, from these cultures, to teach us the languages and then to help to spread them around ourselves because we made the mess, we clean it up. That's the rule in most households with young kids. You know, you make the mess, you clean it up. And I think that is a very important responsibility to take upon ourselves, not to be the white savior, I hate that trope, but to undo or to help in undoing the damage that we caused because language creates culture. 
it is one of the most fundamental things that we could have possibly stolen from them in the residential schools. And I do not condone that theft. And since it was stolen, I want it to be given back. So anyone here an expert at any uh, at any languages, I would love to hear from you because I am currently in the process of teaching myself Italian just because. And it would be interesting to learn a language from a completely different language family than the Romance languages or, you know, English, which is a big hodgepodge of European languages. English was a bit of a mess when it first got started. Anyway, moving on. Maximize. Yeah, by the way, this is me being a word nerd. So, rant away, word nerd. All right, <clears throat> 17. We call upon all levels of government to enable residential school survivors and their families to reclaim names changed by the residential school system by waiving administrative costs for a period of five years for the name change process and the revision of official identity documents, such as birth certificates, passports, driver's licenses, health cards, status cards, and social insurance numbers. Okay, you know what I just said about language being the most fundamental theft that we committed with the residential schools? While I stick to my guns in saying that that is true, we also stole their names, okay? Their literal names. Like, okay, imagine some other nation comes to mainland North America now and puts all of us in these places, says to me, your name is no longer Lily, your name is, I don't know, you know, let's make it some kind of really, really advanced alien civilization. You know, your name is now M4-1600, right? And you no longer are allowed to use your language or your name. You know, you can only use what we assign to you, what we deem to be proper. But the thing was, it wasn't some very advanced alien society that did this, it was us. And the sooner we recognize that, the better. And no, they should not have to pay money to get their names back. This is your freaking name. It's the most, oh my goodness. Like, it's the first thing you say to someone else. Hi, I'm X, what's your name? It's the very first thing we do because it, like, humans like to put one another in boxes. It's just an easier way of understanding one another. Um, you know, culturally speaking, I don't advocate for the box system, but in terms of your name, that's kind of important. You know, you're not going to introduce yourself as Joe Blow if your name is Nancy Smith. It, you know, you're just not. It, it doesn't belong to you. So, really? Names? Like, you're making them pay to get their literal names back. Are you kidding me? Stop it. Stop it. For the... Yeah. Government, you suck. Okay, that one got my blood up. Next. Oh my god. Maximize. Alright. Alright. Under the heading of health. So we're moving on to a new section now. Number 18. We call upon the federal, provincial, territorial, and aboriginal governments to acknowledge that the current state of Aboriginal health in Canada is a direct result of previous Canadian government policies, including residential schools, and to recognize and implement the health care rights of Aboriginal people as identified in international law, constitutional law, and under the treaties. All right, this is one that I know for certain we definitely have not done because when the residential school system was implemented, obvious mental health problems arose out of this. Mental health leads to physical health, you know, and there's all this cultural brouhaha about how 
they're all a bunch of alcoholics. Shut up, okay? Don't go there because, A, that's not true. B, where do you think addictions come from? The root of pretty much every addiction is some form of perceived deficit within the psyche, okay? For hoarders, it could be, you know, wanting to build up a wall of safety between them and the world, or, you know, they lost something or someone very fundamental to them, so they feel that keeping those possessions around them could help them retain some semblance of normalcy. But, you know, that's just one example of addiction. There are multiple different kinds of addiction, and I'm not even just talking about physical addiction. I'm talking about, like, all of the mental health trauma that resulted from the residential school system. Also, the fact that natives living on reserve, um, they don't always have the best access, and by the best access, I mean, like, pretty much any access to Medicare, to health care. Um, I know someone who, uh, he, he is in non-emergency medical transfer, and he picks a lot of people up at the reserve that's about half an hour away from here and brings them to hospitals in the city because they don't have that much in the way of healthcare facilities on the reserve. And, um, you know, this is especially applicable for people who need maybe more invasive kinds of work done. Um, I'm thinking of things like dialysis, surgery, you know, all of these really important processes that keep you alive in the medical sense. They don't have access to this technology on the reserves because they are being actively denied that technology. Um, reserves are not the richest places in this country, nor in America either, I imagine. And, you know, in order to access the things that are literally keeping them alive, in some cases even clean water, they need to get it off reserve. And what this measure is saying is that that can't continue. You know, that can't be the case forever because it's it's just, it's a very negative tipping point. It's like, when is this system going to fall apart? We need broader access to Medicare. And in Canada, thankfully, it is paid for through taxes. The, the uh, problem with that is that natives living on reserve, as long as they also work on reserve, they don't pay taxes, which I think is beneficial. Obviously, they shouldn't have to because they were here first. But at the same time, correspondingly, they don't have the same access to Medicare or many other resources that people, that people who pay taxes have. I think that that is grossly unfair. Again, they were here first. Government. I know you're a greedy jackass. Fork it over! You know, all talk, no action makes Lily an angry girl. Moving on. Oh, yeah, and all I do is talk, I know. I know. Trust me, I know. Moving on. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, wow, I lied. This is making me angry. All right, 19. We call upon the federal government in consultation with Aboriginal peoples to establish measurable goals to identify and close the gaps in health outcomes, sorry, between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal communities, and to publish annual progress reports and assess long-term trends. Such efforts would focus on indicators such as infant mortality, material health, suicide, mental health, addictions, life expectancy, birth rates, infant and children health issues, chronic diseases, illness, and injury incidents, and the available of appropriate health services. So this one as a, con as a continuation from the last one, like I say, the reserves are not the richest places in, in Canada or in America for that matter. At least I would imagine so. So as I say, the problem is that they don't get that much Medicare out there. Also, a lot of reserves are in extremely rural and remote locations. Think of, I mentioned a few episodes ago, think of the Attawapiskat Reserve, which is pretty much 
as far north in Ontario as you can get without hitting the territories. Um, they don't have very much access to education, let alone health care. So when you're living in a place where you have to drink bottled water because the water you get out of your tap is not clean, what do you think is going to happen? One of the major uh, causes of the Black Plague, of all things, was unsanitary water. Also one of the main causes of cholera. There are so many diseases born of dirty conditions and of unclean, unsafe water that could be so easily prevented if we just took a few steps in the right direction. We need to see where the problems lie and who's causing them, and we need to help undo them. That does mean sharing the wealth. I know capitalism, my baby, I know, I'm sorry, but I don't like you, so I can talk to you however I want. That doesn't apply to people, by the way. You can't talk to people however you want, um, just to these faithless entities. Um, yeah, so that really does mean sharing the wealth, and I know I'm a communist, whatever. Fiscally, yes. Um, not necessarily in terms of leadership, but I don't need to get into my exact politics right now. So, yeah, um, we need to give more to the reserves, and I especially have children in mind because my father said that um, he's been to the reserves before, and um, he said there are two kinds of people on the reserves. Really old people, and really young people. There's not that much in the middle. So they have a lot of el uh, elderly, and they have a lot of children. What two age groups are the most in need of Medicare? The elderly and children. Think about this. Come on, do the math, all right? These people need more resources, not necessarily more money, okay? That's the whole problem with Attawapiskat. They keep sending money, <laughs> millions north, that keeps getting embezzled and not getting down to the people. We need social reform, not financial reform. This is an attitudinal thing, okay? You can't just throw money at someone's attitude and make them change their mind. You can't, trust me. That doesn't work. Next. Um, ba -ba -da -ba -da. Ba -ba -ba. Sorry, just a sec. Okay, number 20. Last for today as well. In order to address the jurisdictional uh, disputes concerning Aboriginal people who do not reside on reserves, we call upon the federal government to recognize, respect, and address the distinct health needs of the Métis, Inuit, and off-reserve Aboriginal peoples. Okay. You know how I said that when Indigenous people live off-reserve, they have to pay taxes? And if they work off reserve as well, that is true. Um, while that may be the case, there is still a very large gap in wealth between the dominant cultures and the indigenous peoples throughout Canada, okay? Métis live not exclusively, but predominantly in Manitoba. The Métis nation was basically founded, or at least, you know, collaborated through the work of Louis Riel. Look him up. If you went to elementary school in the same time period that I did, um, so about 20 years ago, oh my god, I'm old. Um, you would have learned that Louis Riel was basically a villain. Do your research. Do your research. He was not, okay? But, okay, so the Métis nation, the Inuit who live very far north, and we're talking, um, like, people in the territories now, so from west to east you get the Yukon, the Northwest Territories, and as of, I believe it was 1998 or 1999, Nunavut, all right, so the three Canadian territories, um, that is predominantly where the Inuit people live, they're basically, you know, the people of the north, um, you know, is basically how we see them. But also just more, shall we say, mainstream Aboriginals who live and work amongst uh, amongst us, um, you know, they may not have the same access to health care that we have because, again, the gap in wealth is just extraordinary. Um, this is the case between 
whites and pretty much any other racial minority as well in the grand scheme of things, okay? Because again, we are the dominant culture, which means that we make the rules, which means that we hoard the money, yada, 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 right? Um, this is why capitalism is going to fail, because we can't keep doing this. Um, it's just, it's not a viable system. It has been a viable system, but not with the world opening up. And for as much as the world opens up, the happier I get, because it means I get to meet new people. Woohoo! Online and in person. In person soon, because I got my second shot. Woo! Get your shots, people! Um, but basically the whole point of this is that a more even distribution of wealth would definitely lead to the improved health of Aboriginal peoples, but also of, you know, many other minority groups, including people with disabilities, including the elderly, including, you know, women and children. It's not a fair game. That's the whole point. It's not a fair game because it's not meant to be a fair game. We need to take it upon ourselves. We, the people, not the government, need to take it upon ourselves to make it into a fair game. The reason why I say that, and I know I'm an idealist, but I don't think I could live if I weren't. But the reason why I say that is because there's more of them than there are of, no, there's more of us, sorry, than there are of them. Might as well get my antidotes right, right? There are more people, you know, on the ground who actually care than there are in the fancy government buildings who don't really care, which is why the TRC has not been even close to fully implemented at this point, which I will talk about at the end of the series because I want to research the things that actually have been put into practice, um, namely the closing, by the way, of the residential schools. Um, that, that was a big thing. That was a big deal. Trust me, that was a big deal. There is not vanishingly small progress. You know, there's been a little more than that, right? But we have a long way to go and we can only do it together, says the idealist in the room. But again, I don't think I could live without my optimism and neither should you. If you're feeling pessimistic, don't. Come over there and slap you. <laughs> no, I won't slap you. I like you. You're very pretty. And I am rambling now. So that was TRC, Calls to Action, numbers 16 through 20. And I'll see y'all tomorrow to continue talking about health and wellness. And probably moving into another section with um, calls 21, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Sweet. All right, so have a lovely, wonderful day. Read the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Thank you, and I'll see you all tomorrow. Mwah.